So, today I want to talk about designing a more effective Stirling enzyme that can be used for a variety of applications and some limitations with Stirling enzymes. But briefly, why is widely applicable and what is a Stirling enzyme? Well, a Stirling enzyme takes heat energy and it from an outside source, so it's not like an internal combustion engine that burns the fuel in the chambers. It's an outside source, and it can be solar energy, it can be waste heat from computer stations, it can be you burn fuel so much, and but it's used a lot of electrical generation from like solar power plants, and it is the most efficient out there. It um, ideally opposes the current cycle of efficiency, which is the maximum efficiency of any type of heat engine, or any engine that uses difference in temperature. Um, and that heat difference condensed cycle is actually one of the easiest equations to derive in all of math, physics, um, which is the energy from the high temperature thing, which I put TH, but it's actually energy, because different, th different things can be same temperature but have different energies, so they can store more in like, the same amount of mass, or there can be more mass there. Minus TC, the cold, the stuff, the energy is stored in the cold one, because remember it's the temperature difference. All that divided by temperature, the hot energy. And the reason why that's efficiency is that imagine that TH is like expanding, it's like a gas expanding or something. It's pushing against the cold thing that's pushing back. So you minus that, it's like I'm hot and I'm pushing you, but you're cold and you can't push with as much strength, but you do push back, so you have to subtract that. Then the total heat energy, because it's is the heat energy from the hot place. So we don't include the um that we don't include the cold place because the cold place is not where we extract the energy from. So you get a top being T H minus T C divided by T H the energy total in the hot place. That also gives us a limit if we just simplify the fraction as one minus the fraction of T C divided by T H, meaning that the hotter something gets, a lot more efficient it becomes. And the colder the other side gets, the lot more efficient it becomes. Now, heat engines are much more widely applicable than just making power electricity or mechanical power. They can, um, if you make the, run them in reverse, you can use it to generate heat and generate cooling on one end. So one end gets hotter, instead of turning electricity or mechanical energy, turn that into one place becoming hotter and colder, making a temperature difference. And we've been looking a lot for it for AC and heat pumps in your house, which heat up, which will work in the opposite direction of AC, but heat up your house. But there's some major drawbacks with those ones in that we don't, can't extract enough heat fast enough compared to with our stirring engines, like which would be more efficient, but just we don't get the raw power we need to reheat up a house or cool down a house. So if we can improve this, you could have a lot more efficient heating of a house and cooling of a house. And fun fact, um, heat pumps, the reverse of AC, actually work more efficient than heating up anything else because they're actually extracting energy from the outside world. So you can have put in, you can put in one joule of electricity, electric en energy, and get two joules of heating out of it, or more. And like normally when you put one joule of electricity, you get one joule of heating out, nearly. And the reason, now that isn't um, breaking law of conservation, because you gain that energy from the outside world when you're heating up the house and you're cooling out the outside world. So a lot of things, but now let's go to a Stirling engine and look at how some of the ways you might improve it. So we can make better also cooling and heating and not only electricity. Well, right now, oh, and electricity from like heat engines are going to still be with solar thermal or geothermal. Oftentimes, so it is practical. Well, how does a Stirling engine work? The typical ones, and I saw a couple pictures here, there's many different ones. So these are just a couple on the Wikipedia page. But they have one or two cylinders, and when a, when a hot gas expands one of the cylinders, 
and that and the cold gas contracts and forces one of the cylinders in the opposite direction. So one of them then it switches places where the place that was hot cools off and contracts and the place that was cold heats up and expands. And that's those two reciprocating ensigns, as I see in these diagrams, moves a whole thing back and forth. Now that's a normal heat ensign, like in a uh, pump or something like that. It's very simple and you would only see one cylinder doing that, it's heating up and cooling, moving back and forth. And there's another one that's not attached, also heating up and cooling, separate. But what the Stirling ensign does that's very weird and innovative is it actually combines two cylinders with a fluid that kind of can transfer in between them. And what happens is when this hot fluid is expanding, the expanding hot fluid can suck out heat from the cold fluid. And it's sucking out the heat from the cold fluid heats, it means it can extract more energy from the cold fluid and it can expand longer, giving it more time to give up its energy. Now when the hot fluid is compressed in one of the cycles and then it starts heating up the other one, so it reverses the cycle, the heat from the compressed hot gas goes into cold fluid and gets heated up faster and expands the cold fluid more. So these two things being by being slightly out of phase, heat from one end goes more easily to the other end, or vice versa, to keep the thing powered and keep it a higher efficiency than a normal heat ensign. The best is if these two cylinders are having uh, about 45 degrees out of phase. And then we have a little leaks in between of the fluid, so fluid can exchange heat even better throughout the entire system. And these, it might seem counterintuitive because you have one place that you want to be hot and one place cold, but this allows it for um, fluid to also have a motion, a repetitive motion, and move back and forth more, and we get reserve some of that energy. You can have many different types. You can have an alpha stirring engine where the hot thing, hot piston and the cold piston are in two different places, not in the same like housing. A beta one where in the same housing moving up and down and they both work together to compress and cool stuff. And you can have gamma and more, but they all work around this. And I really recommend you look at a diagram to figure this out better that I'm just so I'm here on the Wikipedia page, because it's kind of hard to describe in words. Then the other thing that it has, and by the way, these fins here are where the heat goes out. And this is where it heats up with this red thing here. The other thing is have is a weed generator, which stores some of the heat energy in it, so it can stay hotter longer. But this one has a couple problems. One of the first problems that you might notice is that this whole thing has reciprocating, reciprocating motions. Now reciprocating motions is not the most ideal because you have your mass has to change direction and it has momentum. So that causes some energy loss there because it just has to go up and then it has to go down and up and down compared to a circular motion which is always in the same direction. But this also means with all this complex setup and reciprocating motion, that this whole thing cannot adjust to new conditions the best. If it suddenly heats up or cools down fast, it cannot adjust to it fast, unlike almost every other type of heat engine, because it has this cycle. And the cycle is even more important with the heat exchange that I've been talking about, with it exchanging heat from the compressed gas into the uncompressed gas and vice versa. So this reciprocating problem is a huge, huge problem. It also causes more wear and tear. And then it also can make seals harder in this whole thing because you have like a couple more open seals, even though that's more in like the alpha where there's more exposed area. It can lead to vibrations and also to turn it into a circular motion, other motions, you have to have more moving parts and that's more moving parts means more friction. An alternative ensign that we have not really looked into too much for uh, for many reasons. We haven't looked into it for external heat engines like the stirring engine where the heat source is outside, not inside, is a rotary one. So these are all reciprocating, but a rotary one, like there's a wrinkle or something like that, 
a steam turbine will be a rotary one, is that you don't have stuff pistons moving up and down. Instead, you have something turning, turning, and that avoids a lot of the mechanical. With, that avoids a lot of the problems with the piston engine, in that you don't have to worry about translating in these motions, so you don't have less friction because less moving parts. You don't have the vibrations. You don't have to, um, certain change in mass and direction, and so on, so on. So, how would I combine this idea with a rotary engine? And why would it work better for external one? Well, very simple. Let's just imagine an oblong shape. And near the top of it, I put something flat that separates a hot liquid and a cold liquid. And a hot liquid I will draw in this nice red color. And then there's going to be a cold liquid in the bottom part that is now bigger. And that's going to be the cold chamber also where everything cools off, like in the stirring engine. And this is where it heats up. Now when I release it, now when this thing is blocked, seven out of two chambers turn sideways, suddenly the hot gas can expand into it, and the cold gas is forced up. So now the cold gas gets forced up and the hot gas and compressed. It actually gets compressed by this whole action. And then the hot gas cools off as it comes down. And this will be the heating part, which I'll just put over here. Heating part, and this will be the cooling part, which I put here. Now, I have a flywheel or something to turn this again such, so it just continues the momentum. And you will need something to start up the motion in a certain direction, but then you have a flywheel or something that keeps the momentum, keeps it turning in the right direction as this whole thing turns. Now, to make this even more efficient, you can choose much more complex geometries. This is not by far the optimal geometry. In a computer, you probably can find very good geometries which we've been using for rotary engines. And this computer could find a geometry where you could have, for example, mobile oblong ones for the cool and mobile hot ones that work at different phases and keep the whole cycle going more smoothly and keep the separation from the hot and cold better. So you can imagine like one here I do with four chambers and four separating fan here moving, or much more, and you can use a computer to really optimize and figure it out. But the whole point of this system is you don't have to translate any movement, there's no moving parts, which would really increase the efficiency, and because it's all circling, it's always going to be circling. It doesn't matter if, that, if it's, um, it doesn't suddenly start going up when it starts going down. Like in the other one, if you heat up more, you might it might be starting to have expanding going up when it's in the was previously in down phase or anything. This is not going to happen. It's going to keep turning faster and faster over here. If it cools down, it's going to move the turning, but it's not as much force. There's no change in direction of going up, down, up, down, and suddenly have to going up, down faster and messing up the cycle. So a lot more amendable for that way. The other thing about this is that there's a problem with rotary engines nowadays. And because this is one problem, because all the rotary engines we've designed are ext um, external, is that when you have an external engine, you need to have really good seals between the pistons or anything else. So you don't want anything that's expanding in, the, in here to escape between the seals. Like in an internal combustion engine, the pistons have to be well sealed. But in a rotary engine, it has to be even better sealed for a variety of reasons to be efficient, and not even though it doesn't even have to be better sealed, it has to be. It, ha it, it in a rotary engine not only has to be better sealed, it's in this chamber that's changing a lot of things around the whole parameter, whole perimeter. Um, oftentimes, the whole shape of what's rotating is not a circle or something, so it's changing how it's contacting. 
and then you have something outside that's a different shape and all this like I'm going to sew the wrinkle and then for one example um, has really weird shapes uh, going scrolling yeah like this and you can just imagine how many different changes and everything and that causes a lot of problems with the ceiling and why a different seal that was so almost every reason why the wrinkle engine is not popular is due to the seals and the seals break and wear and tear and scratch along the surface so much but again getting back to my new design is remember in the sterling engine you don't want a perfect seal between the chambers in fact what that means in then you want some fluid moving back and forth between the chamber. That means that in this whole thing, there doesn't need to be a seal between touching the chamber. That lets you have even more geometries because everything doesn't perfectly fit together. But you don't have to worry about that friction and seal problem. Again, a win-win when you start combining this technology. Now, to design the ultimate spinning blade, blade and then the outer housing, that would be very complicated and you would need a lot of a computer to do it, but a computer could do this over a while with iterative optimization. Now, I have an idea to make this even more efficient and handle even more, and that is with how the heat is exchanged. So here, we usually put a heat exchanger. Now, Oh, I one more thing I want to say. A heat exchanger can be like a lot of bobs or something over here that gives off heat. Now, the heat exchanger is actually a cold thing, so I sort of put it down here in the bottom. Cold, and that gives off the heat. This is also going to be my trick for keeping this more efficient and getting some heat, is that can be a thermoacoustic stirring engine, which has no moving parts, and instead generates a sound wave. Now, a thermoacoustic engine, how it kind of works, and there's ways to make this a lot more efficient, um, but the simplest one is you have a bunch of plates, metal plates, and then you heat up one end and cool them, and then you have a resonance chamber. Now, cold, cold something cold comes in, gets to the hot part, and the hot part, it expands, then gets to the part where it cools off again and swings. And if you have resonance, you have this thing, gas expanding and shrinking. And that can create a sound wave, like compression to compression. But you need to have um, always resonance from normal happening so it actually builds up and doesn't stay in one place. It's to cause vibrations along the whole thing. Because these vibrations are a lot smaller than, um, uh, than pistons moving or something, because they can be ordered less than a millimeter. And then they also, because they can you can have multiple different frequencies and stuff vibrate multiple different frequencies well. You can adjust it for different heat outflows more in a lot faster. You can also recover energy from stuff moving. Now, if I have this instead as the heat exchanger here at the bottom, I can recover some of the energy that's been lost in this whole setup without adding moving parts, but also dissipating the heat more because these um, sound waves moving about can more easily dissipate heat because the compressed thing can give off heat faster and conduct heat faster than normal air and the moving liquid around this whole thing can also help move liquid in and out of this whole thing, compressing it, but can also adjust to temperature changes faster. And this resonance phenomenon around can build sound waves that travel throughout this whole entire device and actually help spin it. And if they're not used to spin the device, most of that sound wave is used instead just to heat up and it returns back to heat to power this whole engine again. So very little will be wasted if designed properly. So you can add the fins down there. Another advantage of this whole road setup is because it's rotating within the case and everything, you can have a case that's very thick throughout. Unlike a piston engine where you don't want to make the piston too thick, because if you make the piston too thick, you have to move a heavy mass. Now by making this whole thing thicker, you can make it more durable. And the more durable thing could have potentially better, um, be better sealed also. And then you can use stuff like hydrogen and helium more, which notoriously leaks out. And it leaks, also it damages a lot of things slowly. 
hydrogen especially, because hydrogen, it's not a fast degradation, it's not like an acid or something, but hydrogen is so small that it can fit in between the atoms of some metal slowly and slowly cause it to corrode and everything. This happens with all forms of steel and iron alloys, titanium alloys, even copper alloys. It's slow but important phenomenon. But now we have thicker material that's not as much of a problem and when they can handle more warp. It's also with less parts, it's probably easier to be seen except for the thermoacoustic part, but that can be made by, um, but that can be made in a variety of ways where out of sandals of thin plates that are stable together and don't have to be as precise. To um, do this though, it would take a lot of computer optimization to get all these parameters perfect, but that's why we have computers. And then now we might actually get a practical Stirling engine for cooling down the house, which there is one company trying to do it with um, hydrogen and he helium mix. But the problem with that hydrogen and helium mix is that um, hydrogen, again, is corrosive, but it doesn't, it's probably, hydrogen and helium are probably one of the best efficiency wise, but they don't carry much power per molecule. So you need to have a very, very big thing. But this could come, comparatively pack more power for a small thing and get rid of heat faster with the thermoacoustic part so you can ma maybe make hydrogen and helium more practical. The reason why hydrogen and helium is such a good cooling is that it's the most ideal gas, the two of the most ideal gas and lightweight gas. And whenever something like phase changing things like water to steam, yes, there's a lot of power there, but you lose some of the power or just changing it from water liquid to gas, you lose some of the power. When you have anything that's not an ideal gas and expanding, you lose some of it breaking bonds and other things. And with an ideal gas, it expands nicely. And also the expansion is a nice set order of linear. Other things don't expand linearly. So that falls off the phases and everything. and makes the engine design a lot more complicated if you want the ideal one or impossible to get ideal because it's not expanding in the right way. Hydrogen and helium are the closest two things to ideal gas. However, um, the problems with helium is helium is safe. It does leak a ton, but it also is a lot more expensive than hydrogen, a lot, lot more expensive when running out of it. Hydrogen, it's not that flammable as people make out. Helium or hydrogen, depending on the temperature, can be more ideal. But the problem with hydrogen is also, you want a lightweight gas. I forgot to say that. You want a lightweight gas because a lightweight gas it has more energy it goes into, it expands, it changes its, its momentum faster. Remember MV, momentum mass times, mass times velocity? It changes momentum faster so it can expand faster and contract faster, respond faster, which makes it more ideal and more efficient. Hydrogen is about twice as light. Um, it, but it has all the corrosion problem, which helium also can leak through very small thing, but hydrogen can bond to the metals actually and met, make metal hydrides, which slowly can leak through it because the hydrogen bonds to one metal atom, then bonds to one further down and slowly, slowly, and slowly leaks through the whole entire perfectly sealed container. So the hydrogen has that bigger problem. I think a combination of hydrogen and helium actually might be more ideal because helium would disrupt the Hydrogen is more ideal in some cases and is lighter weight, but helium would disrupt the bond, molecular bonds between the hydrogen, and it could be, would reduce the price of pure helium, and it would also reduce the corrosion rate. Um, but that's a later idea. So this is just all my ideas just blobbing about it, and there could be so many more improvements, better heat exchangers and stuff, but this could revolutionize heat pumping, cooling, and just also energy generation. Well, thank you very much for listening. Please like and subscribe. It really helps to turn out. I'm trying to reach 1,000 subscribers in a year and 4,000 watch hours, which is really hard. With your help, I think you can do it. Also, if any of these are future videos, comments, or suggestions, please leave in the comment section below. Again, thank you very much. Goodbye.